So we're here to talk about our history. Uh, and as our history staff will tell you here tonight, it's not for wimps. It takes courage uh, to tell a truthful, well-researched story. It takes courage to be learners of this history. And tonight, we all get the opportunity to be courageous learners. My name is Laura Esparza, and I have the privilege of serving the people of Austin as your host tonight, as well as a division manager of museums and cultural programs for the Parks Department. This division includes the O. Henry Museum, the Dickinson Museum, the Old Bakery, Oakwood Cemetery Chapel, the Dougherty Arts Center, and all the cultural centers who together are responsible for bringing this program to you tonight. I'm also the great, great, great granddaughter, a direct descendant of an Alamo hero, Ana Esparza, who survived the Battle of the Alamo and managed to keep her four small children alive through the battle. Her husband, Gregorio, was one of Juan Seguin's scouts and a cannoneer during the battle. I'm very proud of my heritage as an Alamo descendant, and this book makes me no less proud. We acknowledge with respect that this land that we now call Austin is the traditional and ancestral, ancestral homelands of the Tonkawa, the Apache, the Isleta del Sur Pueblo, the Lipan Apache tribe, the Texas Band of Yaqui Indians, and the Guaguitecas. My heritage is Guaguiteca. It is important to understand the long history that has brought us to reside here on this moment, in this moment, and on this land, and to seek to acknowledge our place within that history. On this land lived William Barton, who in 1836 bought this property. He was a slaveholder. Andrew Jackson Zilker later bought this land and donated it to the, pu to the public free schools to sell to the city of Austin to benefit school to work programs, an act that perpetuated segregation in the early 20th century and subjugated blacks to inferior education. Today, the ongoing displacement and inequitable conditions of black, indigenous, and communities of color in Austin is connected to this history. Therefore, we take this moment to acknowledge our role in a racist system in order to be intentional about how we build respect for the land Respect for, for indigenous people's, people's respect, respect for, each for each other as we rebuild our community. Our moderator is Dr. Andres Tijerina. So pleased that he could join us. Retired professor of history. He received his BA from Texas A&M, his MA from Texas Tech, and his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Tijerina later taught at all of those institutions, as well as at ETSA and Austin Community College. He is the recipient of many uh, book prizes, including the Presidio La Bahia Prize from the Sons of the Republic of Texas. He rec recently received the National Equity Award from the American Historical Association. So I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Tijerina who will begin the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. I want to thank the city of Austin. I want to thank the Parks Department, not only for the beautiful program like this, but for the fact that they are taking a stand uh, with a book like this that is taking a stand in Texas, and also that they are giving us this time to share uh, a literary event as well. Lori, uh, please tell the Park Department that we are very grateful for you all uh, giving us this time in this auditorium. For me to, uh, to be up here and moderate uh, a panel of three, these three authors is a, um, 
a very memorable event in my life, a uh, very important, meaningful event in my life. What they write about is our life in America. They call it the Alamo and it's whatever, but it's America. Um, these gentlemen have been in the world, and I'm just so honored. Brian Burrow, um, it, his bio that you probably read before coming out here says that he's written six books. Uh, he is a member of the Texas Institute of Letters. We're real proud to have him in the TIL. It's one thing to say you've written books. It's another thing to say that when he writes a book, they make a movie about it. <laughs> and the movie wins everything there is to win. Uh, the, the Emmy, the, the Golden Globe, uh, the Writers Guild. And then it becomes something that is... The name of the book is Barbarians at the Gate. And I want you to know the barbarians he's talking about are on Wall Street. That's our America. And he's giving us a, a very uh, perceptive look, an insight into what really happens with those people who play with our money and play with our lives. So that's the kind of people we have here at the table. Brian Burroughs, uh, we're just so proud to have him here. And, and I think that probably the nicest thing I can say about this gentleman his feet are on the ground. He is solid. He's as human, as practical, day-to-day -day Texan as you and I are. The difference is he gets around a lot more, and he's coming back to tell us about our America. Chris Tomlinson is a columnist, yes, for the Houston Chronicle, the San Antonio Express, New York Times, best-selling author. Um, but he's a war correspondent. He's been in 30 countries. He's been in Africa. He's been in Europe. He's, he's been a war correspondent for over 11 years in several, several wars. So when he talks to us about being in Rwanda right after the genocide, talking about Bishop Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela, he's bringing the world to us, and he's telling us how did these people reconcile after the genocide? How, do they, how does a polarized nation do that after apartheid? He said something that I just, I just think. He said about that reconciliation, the truth in reconciliation. One community can't have one idea of what happened and the other community another idea. They must both have the same idea of what truth is for there to be truth and reconciliation. But the most important thing that I've seen him do, he went back to his old family plantation where the, his family owned slaves, and he visited the African Americans who live there in that impoverished community today in East, Austin, in East Texas. And he talked to the people who are living in grinding poverty today. He was with them. And it turned out to be not, a, not a, a reporter coming in and doing a story about them. It's a reflexive analysis about himself and his own family. So when, when Chris Tomlinson talks to you, and he talks to you about America and a polarized America coming together, these people talk with credibility. Jason Stanford is a writer for the American Statesman. The Texas Monthly, when you read the Texas Monthly, this is, these are the gentlemen that you're reading. Um, the Texas Tribune. Uh, he, was, he is political. He knows politics. He was a, a, a communications director for the campaign of, of your own mayor, Steve Adler, here. But he's also been a campaign director and a writer for over 30 members of Congress. These gentlemen have been in the world. They're writing about the Alamo. They took a very brave stand in, for the first time, telling us about the, the falsehoods, the myths, and the so-called heroes. It's a very brave stand that they took. They're here to talk to us tonight about that. And remember, I don't think they're talking about the Alamo. I think they're talking about Austin. I think they're talking about... I think these gentlemen have their finger on the pulse 
of America, the American and what's happening in politics and society today, let alone literature. Now, my big question for them is which one of you guys was it that came up with the big idea to write about the Alamo? And I want the other two to tell us right now, which one was it that came up with the big idea to bite this apple? You know, it, it, the origin of the book, like everything, was collaborative. The idea was Chris's. We were at a breakfast on South Congress on Sunday morning, boring each other with stories about what we were up to. Um, when Chris started telling us about a column that he was researching for, for the Chronicle and the Express News, and it was about the need to rebrand Texas and to rethink the cowboy myth and the Alamo myth, and he said, you know, everything you think you know about the Alamo just isn't true. And we were like, yeah, yeah. You know, we were, I was eating my migas and uh, Jason was eating his way, way most. And at some point he said, what you don't understand is the degree to which the traditionalist narrative of the Alamo has been used to oppress Tejanos for 180 years. And that, I remember that's when I, I, I looked up from my food and said, something to the effect of prove it. And Chris, as he does with all his columns, knew so much about this, just laid it on us for 15 or 20 minutes. And I remember vividly at the end of it, basically slamming my hand down on the table and saying, that's a fucking book. And, and I was like, you know, there are 2,436 books about the Alamo. Does the world really need another one? True, true. And that was on a Sunday, and we had a book deal by, by Wednesday. And at the end of breakfast, I, when that breakfast went on for a while, at the end of breakfast, I said, I, that's when I really got excited. I said, well, if you know, if you want this to be kind of a pie in the face to the traditionalist narrative of this, if you, if you want to get people to sit up and take notice, you got to, there's only one thing you can call it. Forget the hour. And, and that type of breakfast among writer types like us happens fairly often. Somebody's always telling somebody, you ought to write a book about that. And it never happens. And this time, two and a half years later, um, it did. I never get tired of hearing Brian tell that story because it's different every time. <laughs> we had a book deal on Tuesday. Well, no, no, we had a book offer Brian didn't like the money until Thursday. That's true. <laughs> you know, I re what I remember most is Brian and Jason telling me how easy this was going to be. It I, wasn't. I didn't say easy, I said fun. It also was not. <laughs> to, to, to those of you who have not had a chance to, to plunge into the book, the idea, it, the book changed a lot over time. We thought initially that it was going to kind of be a, kind of a book-length essay uh, pointing up some of the myths, uh, but not a terribly long book. And so often happens when we got into it, it became a much bigger thing. It grew and grew and grew until we realized we were telling a history of the history. We weren't just telling the battle. The, the battle and the siege is what? 30%? Yeah, it's a third of the book. A third of the book. And then the rest of it is... How that, how we went from the facts of what happened in 1830, how those got twisted to become this legend that we've all come to know and some of us love and some of us be, be taught in seventh grade. And then the back third of the book is uh, how that's all changed in the last 50 years and how we're dealing with all that now, how with uh, changes in demographics and changes in politics, how that's... Um, made this narrative and its changing symbolism so so fraught for the for the for the state. And Phil Collins. Yeah. Yeah. So we basically just as a, a last bit of overview, what we did is yeah, the book is about the Alamo and but essentially we're tackling is pretty much what you laid out at the very beginning. We're tackling two sets of myths, those associated with the Battle and Siege. Um, in March of 30, 1836, and then also those associated with the broader story of the Texas Revolution, the Texas Revolt, 
um, it goes to the question of why these people were fighting. Um, I must admit, I, I misread uh, so much about this. I thought people would be upset about the myths about the battle and the siege, the fact that not every man died fighting and Davy Crockett didn't die swinging old Betsy and, and it turned out to be the myths about the revolution, I think, that really seemed to have struck a nerve with, with some traditionalists. Let me have that thing going. I, I think this is too innocent. You guys are leaving out the best part. It's one thing to tell us the truth rather than the myth. I don't mind that. Uh, you guys uh, did it with a sledgehammer. <laughs> You're saying that the Americans that came, like David Crockett and William Barrett, Tra came to Texas, didn't come here for freedom and liberty. They came for slavery. You're saying, here, let me, here's the words, slave traders? I mean, we're talking about the guys that your high schools are named after. What are the high schools in Austin? Austin, Bowie, Travis, Crockett, right? How about slave traders, slave owners, drunks, swindlers, political... F okay, gentlemen, how did it make the turn... To really be so candid, to really come right out and tell us another side of the people. Well, let me, I was watching Brian from a distance, and this, that was really his part of the book. <laughs> and Brian wasn't steeped in Alamo lore. He, you know, he likes to tell how he had come and take his socks at college in Missouri. But, you know, you weren't an Alamo head, right? And so when he gets into writing this book, he goes and reads all the history, he reads the diaries, he reads the original, and, and what, the popular, the, what the historians now say, and they all uniformly say that the white settlers came here to colonize Texas and farm cotton, and at the time, he needed slaves. And in academia and among historians, this is not a controversial opinion. This is the consensus. So Brian, having no political sense at all, thinks, oh, I'm just going to write this down, put it in the book. <laughs> What they're really going to be upset about is the line in the sand. And all you know, he's focused on that and like really focused on all Betsy. And did he really surrender? Did the American troops really come across the border and win them? Like all these things. But oh, slavery, but that's just settled law, right? Everyone knows that. And then we get hung up in the latter part of the book about how Phil Collins' collection, which he gave to Texas, that set a lot of the, the events of the last 10 years in motion. Uh, is of uh, dubious provenance if his lawyers are listening. And if his lawyers aren't listening, I can tell you a lot more. <laughs> so we thought the Phil Collins stuff was going to drive the news. And that we thought the Alamo historical community was going to really get hung up on the finer points of taking apart the myth. It kind of, I mean, the slavery stuff just seems so obvious to us that we forgot the main lesson of the book is that for more than 100 years, historians have been trying to tell us what the history is, and politicians have been doing their damnedest to keep it out of history books. And we basically acted out the book, and then became its last chapter with the controversy upon its publication. We were just kind of surprised that slavery drove the news. Well, and I would add that we we are not historians. I mean, so Dr. Tinkerman, you're the historian, and for those who don't know, we leaned on, uh, on the good professor quite a bit. Uh, his research, um, his advice, um, his goodwill toward us as three uh, non-historians who make their living writing words that entertain people, try to find a way to communicate a story that you know, Dr. Tangerine has been telling for 20, 30 years in a way that's going to capture the imagination of a short attention millennial looking at their iPhone. Um, and to do that, you have to write in a brighter, funnier, more intimate way. And I think we, we were very lucky that we had Brian, whose who's style is such a good stylist that he was able to set just the right tone for the moment so that we can tell you some uncomfortable truths in a way that are funny and amusing 
And unless you're really invested in it, you're not going to be too offended. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was the funny thing when you see people get so angry about all this. And I, 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 I get that. We, I, I guess we expected some of it. I was gone from the state for so, for so many years up north, I had forgotten how up, upset um, people can get about it. But the idea with the book was, I mean, frankly, to make it as friendly as we could, to, to make it friendly. Because we knew a lot of people were not were going to expect us to come in here as crazy left wingers saying Texas has just got it all wrong again, which could not be further from the truth. We have all sorts of politics up here, and the, the book was not driven by politics in, to begin with. It was driven by the idea of oh my God, can you believe st Pete, they're still teaching this stuff in schools? This is stuff that has been. Uh, I mean. The worst thing you can say about our book is also the truth, which is not a lot of this is original. Our book is like a lot of public history, a lot of a lot of popular histories is in essence a summation of all the hard work you and your peers have been doing all the last forty years, all the academic work that Give we've that taken <laughs> and packaged and presented to a popular audience. Don't tell me it's not true. Give me that mic. <laughs> You're right. Um, <laughs> and, and I'll be damned if I, if I appreciate somebody coming along and in, and in one little bitty book saying everything I've been trying to say for 40 years. But the truth of the matter is, not only are we grateful, and I know I speak for the audience, gentlemen, not only are we grateful that you could do this for us, but I want to know, where do you get that spark that allowed you to do it? You're not just revisionists. And you know very well that many other people, not just Mexican-Americans, not just Tejanos, have tried to revise and tried to tell this story. And they just didn't listen to us. Well, they did. Other scholars read my books. Yes, thanks. But not the public. I didn't get this kind of crowd. And so I want to say that I'm, I'm just so glad. And I've heard people say, even other, other Mexican-Americans, Latinos, I've heard them say, well, damn it, you know, how come they don't listen to us when we say it and these little white boys come along and they listen to them? <laughs> well, you know what? I don't talk to the public. I write to other historians, Chris. I write to teachers. I write to other professors. You guys can talk to the public. And what I, I, I'm real proud of you. I'm real glad and happy that you've done it. But I want to ask you, can you tell us something about, about your literature or your ability to write? I know this gentleman's got it. He can, he can really just pop a word out there like he did just now and drop a, a bomb on us. But tell me about what's it like writing? How do you communicate with the public? How do you reach out and touch the public? in a way that nobody else has been able to do. I mean, for, for, for me as a writer, I am primarily a journalist. I write for an audience. I write for a general audience. I want the world to be better educated, to better understand the world around them and why the things that are happening are happening. Um, we are at an amazing moment in our nation's history where thanks to demographics and technology and access to information, we are questioning all of our myths, all of the stories we've been telling ourselves. You know, for instance, I mean, the Boston Tea Party, what, it was a bunch of tea smugglers upset that the British were lowering the taxes, not right, raising the taxes. How many people know that? But that's the truth. You know, the Battle of the Alamo was about slavery as much as it was about liberty. That is our local myth that needs to be broken if we want to understand what is happening in our communities. If we want to understand how we are going to live together 
in less than 30 years when Hispanics or Latinx or Chicano or however, whatever word you want to use, becomes the majority in the state. And when the majority in this state are people of color, they are not going to want to believe the racist myths based in white supremacy that we have been touting for the last 150 years. So it goes back to the quote that you took from my first book, Tomlinson Hill. If we're two separate communities, we have to have a shared history. And that shared history has to be based in a, in a common understanding of the truth. And so every day when I try to work on a column and I write my journalism or I'm working on a book, what I'm striving to do is help my audience understand their world better so they can manage it better. And that's why I work on my craft that's why I try to write clearer. It's why I try to write better sentences and smarter paragraphs every day is because I think that is what's necessary if we are to come together as a society. This is, this is what that spirit is a big part of what Chris brought to the book. When you ask me why I do what I do or how I do it, you're going to think I'm joking or trying to undercut Chris. I'm not. I write for my mom. Uh, I'm, I'm not trying to change the world. I'm just trying to tell what I think are interesting stories. And my uh, and the qualification for that has always been: you think it would interest my mom, or would it surprise my mom? And boy, when I started telling her the stuff that you told us at the beginning before we even <laughs> researched, she's like. Well, that can't be true. That's just not true. I just, I've been in Texas for 50 years. I just know it's not true. So uh, we had complimentary uh, visions and, and, and as well as, as did Jason. Jason. I would bet that not half a person here came here tonight to find out how I write. <laughs> okay, one person. <laughs> and I write for her. I write to make my wife laugh. We do see the demography of the United States in the United States Census. We see it changing, almost a sea change. America, we see it in Texas. The growth in Texas is Latinx. It's Latino. The growth in Texas. It's a much more diverse America that we live in. It's a much more discerning, and they're much more, Americans in this audience are much more introspective. And, and when I say that I want to thank you for giving us this kind, of, this kind of awareness, I think it's the audience. I, I said a while ago, I think I speak for the audience in thanking you for giving us this. Um, you're candid. And I truly believe when I talk to each one of you all, as I have, these gentlemen wake up in the morning and they think, how can I share the truth with my reader? They do it because that's their heart. You don't become a great writer. You don't communicate with mom. You don't communicate with um, a racist and tell him these facts unless you're speaking the truth to that person. Ironically, when they oppose you, they really help you out. When someone canceled your seminar at the Bullock State Museum, your book went on the New York Times bestseller. <laughs> Thank you, thank you all. It's so funny because, after, you know, doing the book, especially in the, the middle of it, after a couple of beers, we'd start speculating, do you think anyone is gonna be dumb enough to come after us? 
meaning uh, somebody with a counter with a counterpoint because it just increases awareness and perhaps sales of the book. And the, you guys who know much more, forgotten more about Texas politics than I'll ever know, thought there was a good chance, and I thought, nah, 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 nah. And it, it took a while. It took it took two and a half, three weeks uh, after the book was out for this to happen. And we were horrified because censorship goes against the grain of, of you know, everything we do. But it was so obviously censorship. And it so obviously redounded against that point of view that um, I, I can't say I was glad for the incident. But um, there was a lot of truth in that moment um, that I didn't regret. Hey, uh, I want to steer back to what I think the soul of the book is, and that's you. Uh, Brian and I were going on our merry way trying to write a fun book. And then we interviewed you. And that's the day this book got deep for us. Chris was already there. And that's when we realized what mission we were on. We were interviewing you as a historian. We had no idea we were interviewing one of the central characters of this book. And you told us what it was like taking seventh grade history as the son of migrant workers in West Texas when you were made to stand up in front of a class and call Andy and said it could be your grandparents who killed Davy Crockett. And that's when we realized there are a million stories like that out there. And that's when we realized that's why people call Hispanics Mexicans in this state. And they're just, that's, that's the animating force. You were the animating force behind this book. And then you came up in the 90s again. And then, you know, you keep, you're zelly in this book. Yeah, we were about halfway through. And I, I think like you, we were not in the place Chris was. And I really thought this was more about a fun way to correct history. Yeah, myth busting. Myth busting. And then talking with you and some of your peers, we realized the cost, the incredible cost that people, an entire ethnicity, had paid because of the distortion of this myth. That it wasn't just, ha ha, isn't it funny that we tell this crazy version of the Alamo. It was, look, look how it's been used to keep people down all these years. You know, and I, I just want to, and that the cancellation of our event, the consistent campaign, has as much to do with American politics today mm -hmm. and the issues we're confronting today, and almost very little to do with whether or not slavery was a major factor in the revolution. Serious people know it was. Serious, that, that's, as we've shown a hundred times, that's been established. What we did not realize we were stumbling into was a culture war that was distinctly 2021. Mm. When the Republican Party decided that vilifying the 1619 Project was a way to set up a boogeyman for them to attack and ridicule and build white grievance against, well, it didn't take long for their compatriots down here to Texas, down here in Texas, to see Forget the Alamo as a local 1619 project. So when Dan Patrick and company keeps talking about how our book is the Texas 1619 project, first of all, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I'm not worthy. <laughs> And second, of course, of course we are. Of course, you know, I had not thought about critical race theory since I graduated from UT in 1992. And suddenly I am the exponent of critical race theory in Texas and I'm going to single-handedly bring down the state. Um, we are a convenient target. And I think Andres, you're right. If, if we had been three Latino writers, I'm not sure we would have gotten the blowback. It would have been, oh, that's expected. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been doing this for 30 years and we've ignored them for 30 years, so we're going to ignore them for another 30 years. 
But when, you know, when you've got New York Times bestselling authors who are white guys with accents like mine saying it, well, that's a beachhead. And that is a beachhead that they really wanted to defend against. But, and let me go ahead and close because I, I'm, I'm being tapped on the shoulder over here. <laughs> but here's the difference. We can say it, but when you heard it, and I appreciate it, Jason, I, I, I'm moved by your words. I'm, I'm so moved by what you said. I'm so grateful to you. But when you heard it, Jason, you took up the flag. You picked up the banner and you marched forward with it. And that's what we're grateful. I've got visitors here from Mexico City that came here to hear you tonight. Uh, Mr. Carlos Gonzalez Manterola, uh, Roberto Ramirez, flew from Chicago, got here just before six. And he's leaving tonight back to Chicago. They want it because this book is important to us, gentlemen. And you are the ones that took up the banner. So again, for the audience, I want to thank each of you, not only for your literary skill, certainly for being here tonight and sharing your very personal experiences with us, but for taking up the banner and for having the courage, the courage to try every morning when you wake up to tell the truth to a polarized world. Because in your heart, you're thinking, how do I share the truth with them to bring this world together? So I want to close by saying thank you for seeing the Alamo as a paradigm by which we can candidly examine ourselves as Americans. That's what you've been able to do. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have these three gentlemen with us tonight. Please give them a round of applause. I'll go ahead and uh, we got a couple of questions uh, from uh, the public that I wanted to um, relate and see if, uh, if it results in any good conversation. Listen, um, I, you've answered a lot of them, uh, a lot of the questions that were asked, but what are, uh, oh look, there's more questions, great. What do you think were some of the motivations of the Tejanos in the rebellion? from your research or from your thinking? Uh, the town was fighting a different, a different war. Uh, they didn't realize that their allies, in essence, were not fighting uh, to overturn or fighting in favor of the, the Constitution of 1824, that the Anglos, in essence, were fighting for their independence. And this was entirely lost on the Tejanos, who, after all, had been the Texians one steadfast ally since the beginning in, 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 in commerce, in lobbying Mexico City for all the things they needed, including overturning every single ban on slavery. The titles were there for the Texans. And they thought that they were fighting you know, to, over, you know, to overthrow you know, uh, 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 tyranny, if you will. And that was not uh, as, as became clear what the Texians were fighting for and that led to really one of the things that most shocked me. I mean, I was a traditionalist until I'm 60 now, until I was 58. I, I drank the Kool-Aid, I joked with friends in New York about how great Texas was and all that. I didn't know it. And one of the things that shocked me most about the book was the price the Tejanos paid mm. after 1836, after independence, that it was in essence an ethnic cleansing in which mm -hmm. they were pushed out of Victoria, out of you know restrictions placed in San Antonio. An awful lot of people fled to Mexico. 
Um, and they were, to say they were marginalized is, is I mean, they were all but eliminated. Uh, or, or they were placed on uh, a level of, of, of farm animals in the eyes of many of these incoming uh, Southern Anglos. Um, anyway, that's a, a long... That's what happened to my family. We know that story. I, I don't have anything to add. Yeah. Uh, in the book, uh, she asks, do you write about all of the um, brown children that surround the Alamo that never received their 300 acres like Angelina Dickinson's Babe of the Alamo? And I'm not sure if it was 300 or 165 acres that heroes of the Alamo were granted. I know my grandmother received it, but because she wasn't English speaking and she didn't know how to claim it, that her land was taken away from her um, after surviving the Alamo. But is there anything else that you know about the, uh, the land grants that were made to heroes? No, I, I mean, this book is what, 300 pages? We <laughs> could easily have been 900. Uh, uh, our friend Steve Harrigan has a very 900 page uh, history of Texas, but I'm, I'm afraid yeah. that, is, that is one thing we did not know. So how many Texians fought at the Battle of Co Co Cos in 1835? Fought, who also fought in the Alamo in 1836. Do you know? Uh, like, of course. Coast. The coast, coast, coast was the general. Yeah, I talked about uh, the when the Anglos captured. Was that Battle of the Siege of Beja? The Siege of Beja. Yeah. Yeah. It had to be the yeah. Siege of Beja. 1835 had to be the Siege, siege of Beja against Cos. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you know how many of those? We, we don't. And I, don't I don't think anyone does. does. I mean, one of the big. I mean, even today, people argue about how many people were actually inside the Alamo and who was in it. Uh, we know that the names written on the cenotaph is not accurate. Um, but outside of that, it's, these are still things people debate with great intensity, and that's, that wasn't our thing. This question asks, how many Tejano soldiers from... Uh, ultimately received pensions for their service from the state of Texas? I don't know. That, this is not, I mean... It was not a focus. This, this was not a focus of our book, and it's, it, these are important facts, and my understanding is, from what we cut, what we didn't include, was that almost no Tejanos. I mean, we know that Adina de Zavala, as the granddaughter of the first vice president of the Republic of Texas was involved in litigation to get the land that her family was owned all the way up to her death. And there was no clearer claim than that. Um, and she died in like 19, in the 50s, 19, yeah. 1950s. Yeah, the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So this question is, what was Houston's motivation in leading the rebellion? What do you think it was? Oh, boy. Uh, we, might, uh, we might disagree on this one. That is, well, um, look, there were, uh, Houston was a, a, a disgraced American politician who went, uh, who left Tennessee, went and got drunk for a few years in, in Oklahoma, and then settled quietly in Nacogdoches uh, to be an attorney. And everybody thought, what the heck is Sam Houston, who five years early, earlier was rumored to be running for the White House, what is he doing in Texas? the general feeling among his neighbors, his peers, and his biographers has been that he was waiting for Texas to fall from the Mexican tree so that he could be president, prime minister, emperor, or something. Um, in the very next breath, most people would say, and you know he's here because his mentor was the president, Andrew Jackson, and many people believe that he was essentially had been sent here as a kind of, you know, to, to get America for Andrew Jack Jackson, to get Texas for Andrew Jackson. And we write uh, a good deal about this. We basically come down on it uh, this way, that, you know, this feeling that Houston was a, a conspirator who came to Texas to steal it has been a conspiracy theory that has been popular 
is not dominant in Mexico and Mexican media for 180 years. It has been broadly dismissed as silly by American historians. Long story short, we find there's significant circumstantial evidence to back up the theory, but no smoking gun. Do you have any idea why he left the Cherokee? No, I mean, he clearly was on a mission to reinvent himself. This was his second act. You know, after failing in Washington, um, coming to Texas, uh, living with the Cherokee, I think he was ready to, to make one last attempt. As he said, uh, I think what the quote is, you know, with this razor may one day shave the uh, chin of a president of a republic. Um, you know, I, I think there is so much smoke around a coordination between Houston and Washington about, you know, the buildup of troops in Louisiana, the offer to send troops across the Sabine to back up Houston if he, re if he retreated across the Neches. Uh, we know there were standing orders. So, I mean, you know, one person says that, you know, Houston wanted to deliver Texas to Jackson like a loyal dog dropping a bird at his master's feet. And I think there was some truth to that. I think Quentin Tarantino could make an incredible biopic of Sam Houston's <laughs> life. And I don't think there's any fair reading of the erratic of events of the years leading right up to the Texas Revolt that would indicate that he would be in any way a stable covert co-conspirator. The man's nickname was Big Drunk. I wouldn't, uh, I can't, I can't see him really being the secret agent you embed with Texas. So the book defines the truth, but will it necessarily bring about change? It already has. We, it, it has. Look, it, 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 it all depends on how you define change. Is it gonna change the way the legend is taught in schools? No. Um, is it, it's not going to have that type of immediate change. I think our goal, to the extent that we had any goal that we could agree on, is that we wanted to change the conversation. We wanted there to be a conversation about this. Um, nothing changes overnight. That would be naive. But the fact that we're having this, that this book has been written about, uh, oh my God, from Texarkana, from Texarkana to Thailand, uh, it, it, it strikes me that we've gotten over that threshold. These guys warned me um, what it would be like to publish a book. Did you hear those crickets? <laughs> they said, you know, and they, they told me exactly right, we'll get all the reviews. Brian was on NPR's Fresh Air, and even our close family members would be saying, oh, you wrote a book. I hadn't heard anything about that. Through uh, the miscalculation of Lieutenant Governor, it jumped the shark. Like there is a there is a uh, a community of people who were paying attention to books and noted that our book came out and did in fact reflect light and existed. And then Dan Patrick did his thing, and then regular people cared. And since then, it's been part of the regular people discussion. To the extent like people are recommending it to my mother, not knowing that I told her, and she lives in <laughs> Northwest rural Washington State. It's this book, uh, there was a, a preacher in rural Pennsylvania who based an entire sermon around the book. It's become a thing that people talk about. And just right downtown at Mexico, I wanted you to, I wanted you to bring this up. This is so cool. There is a, uh, an installation by an artist named Michael uh, Machado. Machado? Machado. Machado. Yeah. Machado. And it's this great uh, video installation that includes news coverage of Dan Patrick censoring us from the Bullock. So we have become, the book has become part of the culture. Yeah. And the culture always wins. Look what Disney did with Davy Crockett. And now all the old white boomers in America still think he wore that hat and went down swinging old Betsy. And like, that is, that, that culture, you can't undo that. That is Santa Claus and Jesus Christ wrapped in the one. Now, I'm not saying we are at that level, but it's going to be impossible to have a regular conversation about the Alamo 
for the next 10 years yeah. without this awareness being there. Uh, oh no, truly. I mean, this is, I grew up hearing the story of the Alamo just about every day of my childhood. It was a very central part of our growing up because of the awareness. And it was a, a very uncomfortable awareness that we were descendants, direct descendants, right? So it really has posed for my family, this book has sort of raised this question, how do we tell the story to our children going forward? You know, uh, and so that's what I would like to address in uh, my next book, and figure out how do we tell this story uh, in a way that it tells the truth. So, how do we continue to tell the truth to our children? Where do we tell it? What's the role of museums? What's the role of interpretive sites um, for keeping it going? You know, it was stunning to me. That was the. I moved here when I was 23. These folks have deeper roots here. It's stunning to me that a state that, fear, that talks so tough and has a self-image of such resolute independence is such a fragile snowflake when it comes to their own history. <laughs> the United States of America has no problem admitting that slavery existed and the first how many presidents owned slaves? We have no problem having these two truths coexist in our head that George Washington was an important leader in our founding and Thomas Jefferson and they enslaved people. But somehow suggesting the same thing about a towering nitwit like Travis Barrett. Uh, Bowie. Yeah, Bowie. Yeah, Bowie. Like somehow we have to we have to we have to treat him like a saint. Uh -huh. And we can't have even a comic book level of, of nuance with these people. It's just embarrassing. And I think the younger, it's it's my generation and above that are a bit fragile about the Texas myth. My children had absolutely no problem. They're Texas born, they took Texas history, they have absolutely no problem accepting that Texas is not what it says it is. And I think the young people are going to save us on this one. Yeah. I think this, I think this from here, uh, here on, it goes, it goes organically. I don't, I don't think it needs, I mean, it can, sure, it can be taught in museums and stuff, it will, but I think this is going to be uh, in homes, parents to kids, yeah. kids to kids. Can I just say one last thing that, that I, you know, people want to keep praise on us for this book, and we're happy, like any authors, that's just great. But the stunning thing about this is that it's 2021, and this book is just being written. Mm. Now, we, we can look back and we cite many books, uh, many of them from the 90s, which was kind of the, the first boom of questioning the Alamo. There's a bunch of books, please look at ours for a list of them, that in some ways tried to do much the same thing um, as ours, but that for whatever reason just didn't catch on. Uh, I don't know what it is about ours, if it's the punchy title or, or what, but I can't believe that all this is happening. This could easily and should have happened 30 years ago. Yeah. Because the facts have not changed. No, and we always knew this shit anyway, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it was so surprising because every time I pick up an Alamo book, I have to shiver a little bit because my family still has PTSD from the Alamo. Uh, and so I was very surprised when I picked it up and it was so funny. It had me rolling. My husband was like, what are you reading? I mean, it, it just totally cracked me up. Was it a deliberate decision to write it in Texan? <laughs> yeah, Penguin wanted Brian's voice and Brian's very Texan. <laughs> we, we... We knew that it had to be casual. It had to be like someone was talking to you. Because if someone was lecturing you, we figured people were gonna put that book down fast. And so humor is just part of that. We all contributed. Uh, the funniest line in the book is your footnote about discovering that you were distantly related to Travis and actually kind of looked like him. Um, <laughs> So that was just all part of trying to make the book accessible. Also, you can't be funny unless you're telling the truth. All good jokes are true. And 
I've always, you asked about writing style, and really, if, if I can't make it funny, then I don't really know what the truth is. Mm -hmm. And in this one, we were telling the truth well enough that how do you avoid the jokes? Yeah, yeah I, I have to come back to what I, I stated a while ago. Um, yes, yes, you hit at the right time. There is a major shift, a demographic shift in America. Americans are much more diverse and we know it. We are looking for the truth now. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you what I think is the answer to that. The reason there's hit is because this is good literature. And that is it. They are good writers. And good literature is when somebody writes something that makes you want to read it and makes you want to keep reading it. That's why I think it hit. So we're so very pleased that all of you came out. It was such fun uh, to listen about this book, almost as much fun as reading it. If you haven't read it yet, then get to it. It's very good. It's really a fun read. And, um, you know, we enjoyed our evening. What could be better? Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. And thank you for coming out. And thank you for reading. That was unlucky. You guys are fine. That was unlucky. You guys are fine.